Welcome! This video will review glucose regulation and utilization in the body. And we'll start just by looking at this beautiful image on the title slide. This image comes from a section of the pancreas and it's visualized through a microscope. And this red globular structure is something called a pancreatic islet. So this is just like a cluster of cells in the pancreas that produce two hormones that are really vital to our topic today, regulation of blood glucose. Those hormones are insulin and glucagon, and we'll talk a lot more about those in a minute. But first, let's take a step back. So let's say you've just eaten a meal with carbohydrates, maybe peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a glass of milk. And as we've previously discussed, you'll digest the carbohydrates in that meal down through several enzymatic processes in the small intestine. Um, and you'll absorb monosaccharides across the enterocytes of the small intestine into the bloodstream. And then they'll head off to the liver. And in the liver, fructose and galactose are converted to glucose. And as a consequence, after any meal containing carbohydrates, you have this surge of glucose into the bloodstream. So what do we do with that surge of glucose? Well, we need to use some of that glucose right away, probably. Um, but then we also need to store some for later, because the fact is we need a steady supply of glucose throughout the day and night, um, not just when we're eating, but also when we're in class or at work, um, when we're exercising, when we're sleeping. We need something called homeostasis. And this word just means that we need our blood glucose to be in a sort of steady state not too high, not too low, all the time. We need a pretty, um, a pretty stable blood glucose. So how do we do that? As I mentioned at the start, the pancreas plays a really key role in helping us regulate our blood glucose. So here again is that pancreatic islet that produces those two important hormones, insulin, glucagon, insulin and glucagon. Um, and this image is just showing our goal here is to maintain this stable blood glucose homeostasis. Um, if our blood glucose tips a little too high as it would after a meal containing carbohydrate, then the pancreas secretes insulin. And insulin allows cells around the body to take up glucose from the blood, and that will help bring us back to blood glucose homeostasis by lowering blood glucose. Then, on the other hand, if blood glucose dips too low, we have low blood glucose as it might, um, you know, while we're sleeping or if it's been a while since we've had a meal or we're exercising hard, um, the pancreas then secretes this other hormone, glucagon, and glucagon signals um, that we should break down glycogen in the liver um, to release glucose into the bloodstream and that again will raise our blood glucose so we, we again return to blood glucose homeostasis, so back to our happy blood glucose levels. Um, and this slide just shows that blood glucose and insulin pattern over 24 hours. So what you can see um, is that there's three meals here, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Glucose is shown in red and insulin is shown in blue. And um, you can see that when um, after a meal, as you'd expect, your blood glucose level comes up, but almost immediately insulin also increases and that insulin response is what helps you bring your blood glucose level back down. A kind of neat thing that this image shows also is the difference between a starch rich food for um, lunch and a sucrose rich food for lunch. And what you can see here is um, that when you eat the high sugar meal, you get a higher blood glucose spike. Um, and as a consequence, you get a higher blood insulin level. And because insulin goes so high to handle that sharp spike in blood glucose, it also causes a faster, kind of more precipitous, lower drop in blood glucose um, when, it, when it comes back down. And so that kind of explains why if you have a really sugary meal, like say you have a big slice of birthday cake, you might kind of feel high energy for a little bit, but then you might feel really low energy pretty soon after. And I think we've all experienced that. So um, that uh, system of regulating blood glucose works really well. It responds a little differently depending on the composition of the meal.
So next, let's look at how insulin actually helps glucose get into cells. Um, so insulin, shown here, is this triangle. Again, this is a hormone coming from the pancreas. Uh, it's released into the bloodstream, and cells around the body have these insulin receptors on their cell membranes. So insulin binds to its receptor. And through a cascade of several reactions, that binding of insulin to its receptor causes these glucose transporters to open on the surface of the cell. And these are a specific type of glucose transporters called GLUT4s, so sometimes you'll see those labeled GLUT4. Um, so those transporters open and that allows glucose to enter the cell, and of course as a consequence that brings your blood glucose levels down because glucose that was outside the cell is now coming inside the cell. Now once glucose enters the cell, several things could happen to it. Um, if that cell needs energy right away, so all cells do need energy and use a lot of glucose as, uh, as a fuel, um, that glucose can be metabolized through a process called cellular respiration and that produces ATP, our kind of energy currency of the body that the cell could use right away through that um, metabolizing glucose through cellular respiration. Now, if we have more glucose than we need at this time, we probably want to store some for later or store that energy in some form so that we can draw on it later. Um, if this cell is a muscle cell or a liver cell, it could synthesize glycogen or storage form of glucose. So that's one thing we could do with that extra glucose. Um, or uh, we could synthesize fatty acids and we could store the energy contained in the bonds of glucose. We could kind of store them in the form of fatty acids instead and then again that could be an energy source for later. So we want to look next a little closer at what happens to glucose once it enters the cell. Um, so that we can look at these processes a little bit closer. So if you want to break glucose down for energy or to form fatty acids, you start with this process called glycolysis. And this is a really simplified diagram here, but glycolysis is actually a series of reactions. Um, but in our simplified diagram, we can see that through this process of glycolysis, these, these, this series of reactions, we end up taking our six carbon glucose and at the end of glycoly glycolysis, we get two molecules of something called pyruvic acid or pyruvate, and each of those contains three carbons. So all of our carbons are still here, but they've been shuffled around and now they're in two different molecules. Um, you get a little bit of ATP from this process of glycolysis, um, but just a couple of molecules of ATP. So that pyruvic acid can then be transported into the mitochondria, the cell, and there it's converted to another molecule called acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA can enter this series of reactions called the Krebs cycle. Sometimes you'll, be, you'll hear it called the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle. Um, this cycle uses oxygen and produces carbon dioxide as well as producing these really important high energy electron carriers NADH2 and FADH2. And these guys go through yet another series of biochemical reactions that happen in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. Um, and this is called the electron transport chain. And through this series of reactions, we get a lot of ATP production. Um, so this is how we use glucose to produce ATP for the cell as an energy source. And then remember, if the cell already has enough energy, we can also see on this diagram some other things we can do with glucose. We can um, divert it here, um, taking this acetyl-CoA, we can use that um, to synthesize fat and store that energy to use at a later time. Um, or we can just starting here from glucose, we can use that glucose to synthesize glycogen and again store it for later. Now, really interesting thing is to look at what happens when we don't have enough glucose. Um, we've talked uh, several times in this class already about how there are some cells in our body, especially brain cells, that really require glucose as an energy source. So what are we going to do if we're not consuming glucose? This might happen if we're eating a very low carbohydrate diet or if we're starving.
So one thing we can do is we can take amino acids, um, which are the building blocks of protein, and we can rearrange the carbons in those amino acids through a process called gluconeogenesis um, and make new glucose from amino acids. That can give us some glucose supply. The problem with this, with relying too much on this, especially if we're in a starvation state, is that you'll eventually be breaking down your body's protein, mainly in the form of muscle, to give your brain energy. And if you, we think sort of back to our evolutionary past, if we're out there trying to hunt down your next meal, you really need those muscles. So we need to have another pathway to get energy um, when we're in this, this state of having not enough glucose. So gluconeogenesis works for a little while, but we have this other pathway um, called ketogenesis. So this starts with fat breakdown. And um, remember that we can store a lot of energy in fat. Um, we can break down fat to acetyl-CoA, and some of that can go through the Krebs cycle to generate ATP. But what happens is that if we don't have um, much carbohydrate coming in, um, the Krebs cycle gets really easily overwhelmed. There aren't, um, there isn't enough of sort of um, baseline material to run the Krebs cycle. And so the Krebs cycle stops working or can't work fast enough. And this acetyl-CoA instead um, can be converted to uh, molecules called ketones, sometimes called ketone bodies. These can then be transported in the blood to different tissues of the body where they can be used as an energy source. And that's especially important, again, for the brain um, because the brain doesn't use fat as an energy source. It can use glucose and it can adapt in certain situations after about three days of not having enough glucose because of low carbohydrate diet or starvation, the brain can adapt to using ketones as an energy source. So we can see that in this figure. Um, here again in the liver you can make some glucose from protein through the process of gluconeogenesis um, and you can also break fatty acids down to acetyl-CoA and, um, and then those will be converted to ketones. Ketones and uh, glucose can both, both travel through the blood to the brain. In the brain those ketones can be converted to ATP as an energy source, a fuel source. Uh, for the brain so that you can keep thinking clearly um, and figure out how you're going to find more food or how you're going to get some carbohydrates. Um, so this is really important because once the brain adapts to using ketones um, in this state, that spares the protein, that spares your muscle from being from breaking down to, to be used to make glucose. Um, you can, you can um, adapt to using ketones in this situation. So I hope that this video has helped you understand how we regulate and utilize glucose in the body and also what happens if we don't have enough of it.